Okay, so we'll do something a little different now and talk about dynamic methods. And I will try not to emphasize experimental or theoretical aspects so much because I imagine most of you actually never really want to do shockwave experiments. Instead, I want to make it possible so that you don't have to do shock experiments. You can just take the numbers out of the literature or from the laboratories or from your colleagues and you can analyze them. You can make your own new ruby fluorescence scale or pressure scale or you can do some experimental analysis. That's the whole idea of this presentation. If I speak too quickly, or if I say something you don't understand, wave your hands and I'll stop, okay? All right? All right. So first of all, let's give some context about why we think about dynamic high pressures. And I do this by looking at the trade-offs that we normally have in high pressure experiments. The logarithmic plot of uh, pressure, the volume of our sample, and the time scales of our experiments. I'll try and stay out of the way here. And as you know, if you want to study large samples for long periods of time, it is very difficult to get to high pressures. However, there's a trade-off between force, that is between size of the sample and pressure, such that for very small samples in the diamond anvil cell, for example, you can get to very high pressures of the order of many megabars or hundreds of GPA. If you go to very short time scales, microseconds or less, you can also get to very high pressures, but in this case for relatively large volumes. And what's being conserved here is the product of energy times time, which formally has the units of action. So I've shown here typical values of the maximum pressures that have been generated in the laboratory with various dynamic methods as well as with various static methods. And we will focus on these dynamic methods, but I want to acknowledge the contribution over here. We do have some problem with the display. This is megabars here. This should be gigabars up here, which is a pressure range being approached in samples that are a fraction of a millimeter across using dynamic methods. One last thing about dynamic methods, the smaller the sample, the shorter the time scale involved. That is the higher the time resolution simply because of the wave velocity. We'll talk about the travel time of waves across a sample. Across a small sample, you have only a short period of time. So the reason that we focus on dynamic experiments is they provide the highest pressures that are available in the laboratory. Now pressure is not the only thing of importance in life, we all know that, but for some uh, aspects of what we want to study, pressure is very interesting, and we've heard about this already. In a different context, we've heard that at pressures of the order of a megabar, the compressional energy, pressure volume energy, is of the order of electron volts. This is an approximate sign. So this is why chemistry fundamentally changes at megabar or 100 GPA pressures. Actually, the force the quantum force that holds the electron from collapsing into the atom has pressures of the unit, I'll call it the Bohr pressure, of 23 megabars, 2.3 uh, terapascals. So that's a fundamental property of the atom, uh, and that's to be compared with the so-called atomic unit of pressure. It's really the atomic unit of energy density, which is nearly 300 megabars, 29.4 uh, terapascals. Meanwhile, for those of us interested in planets or astronomy, we know that the properties of the deep interiors of planets are modified by the very high pressures that scale as the density of the planet squared and the radius of the planet squared, such that the Moon has central pressures only of a few GPA, Earth about 100 times higher, and Jupiter another factor of 20 higher, and supergiant planets up into the gigabar giga range. So fundamental changes not only in chemistry, but actually crushing of the atomic orbitals. Finally, a very important process again for planetary science, but quite frankly, how and why we exist as we do, is that planets get put together by impact processes, and these scale according to the orbital velocity. This is just Kepler's law in another form, so that pressure associated with the construction of planets, those impacts, scales as the mass of the star, the density of the planet, and one over the radius of the orbit, in case you're interested in exoplanets. So let me give you a little bit of background so that you can see where these relationships come from. And I will try and keep this simple enough, but not too simple, just enough so that you can actually use the results. We will think initially in terms of a simple one-dimensional picture of a projectile approaching a target of some kind, a half space, at a velocity of u sub zero. The target is not moving, 
It has a no initial pressure, it's at zero pressure. It has an initial volume or initial density given by subscript zero and an initial energy. The projectile also is at zero pressure, also at an initial density or volume and energy, but it is moving at some substantial velocity, perhaps on the order of kilometers per second. We will ignore strength effects at first, Okay, I'll tell you right now what you already know, and we'll come and re review this in a few minutes. The pressures we're talking about, hundreds of GPA or terapascals, are way above the yield strength of most materials. So we actually don't have to worry too much about the fact that materials have strength. We'll come back and uh, deal with this detail. And for the time being, we'll ignore phase transitions, although we'll come back and talk about this. So with this one-dimensional picture, let me first give you the picture that you should have in your mind as you think about shock wave processes. On impact, a pressure wave is sent into the target going to the right. A pressure wave goes to the left into the projectile. And in this zone, the material is taken to very high pressures. It's taken to a finite material velocity. The target was not moving. The projectile, however, it was moving and it is slowed down to the same velocity as the target at high pressure. I'll note, for example, that where we have zones of high pressure that are in contact with vacuum, for example, right here on the edges, of course, the material at high pressure sprays out and evacuates itself, actually vaporizes into the vacuum, as shown schematically here. We'll talk a little bit about these so-called rarefaction zones. So first, we'll think in a little more detail about the balance, the conservation of linear momentum, of mass, or of continuity conditions, and also of energy in this zone right here. We'll think in terms of a simple diagram of distance and time. So a shock wave goes to the right into the target material. A shock wave goes to the left into the projectile. I've drawn this so the projectile is thinner than the target. Think of the target as a half space. Once the shock wave going back into the projectile hits the back surface, it also sprays out or vaporizes material and creates a rarefaction wave that goes back to the right. That's this little rarefaction here with a little plume of vapor behind it. We won't talk about this detail for a little bit. Oh, and the material itself is accelerated forward in the target. That means this interface has moved forward at the material velocity U sub p. So you've actually now already seen the conservation relations, but before I re-derive them briefly for you, I want to mention very, very briefly how we actually measure these things. There are many experimental methods in detail, but the basic scheme nowadays mostly depends on optical probes. Imagine a shock wave going through a material, perhaps this is a metal, perhaps it's a transparent dielectric material. One way or another, we can probe either the surface or the interior of this material, typically with a laser. And nowadays, the most common type of observation is to look at the light which is reflected either off of the back surface or off of the shock front or off of internal interfaces within the sample. And we measure the shift in the laser frequency due to the Doppler shifting associated with the velocities. If you want to come across as an expert, here are the special names that you need to know. PDV and Visar. Doesn't matter what they mean. Just say PDV, Visar, we know the results. I'll tell you what they mean. It's simply just a technical means of measuring the Doppler shift of the la reflected laser light due to the internal velocity variations. And this is an example of a Visar record where we make observations over a few nanoseconds in time and the fringe shifts here uh, as uh, imaged across the, the sample uh, give us uh, the velocities in kilometers per second. In addition, we might measure the uh, thermal luminescence from the sample. You can't read this in the back, so let me say what it says. It says, check. Black body spectrum. Is this a black body spectrum that we see as a function of time? That's something that can be measured. Why is that important? We want to reassure ourselves that what we're measuring is in some kind of thermodynamic equilibrium. That's not always the case. Sometimes there are emission lines and other funny things that go on, but uh, we won't go into that today. In any case, we can in general measure a meaningful temperature that follows a Planck-like spectrum modified by emissivity and so on. But the point is we measure optical properties of the material at high pressures and temperatures. We can infer the temperature from the black body or gray body like spectrum. And as you'll see in a moment, we can derive the density and pressure. Any questions so far? So 
Before I introduce you once again to shock waves, I want to mention one thing, which is that the sound velocity of materials typically increase with pressure. And this is actually a plot that um, I've calculated using methods that I'm going to show you in a few minutes for calculating sound velocities along shock Hugonios, shock fronts. That's shown by the black curve and also the red curves are for along the Hugonio. And also you can use equations of state to calculate sound velocities. That's shown in blue. And again, I can remind you how to do that. But the point is that in general, sound velocities increase with pressure or with compression in most cases. And this is related to the stability of the material. So more specifically, you know that if you have a fluid, we're ignoring strength effects right now, pressure volume curve for a fluid the equation of state usually is concave upwards and the sound velocity squared gives us a slope so what this means is the sound velocity increases with increasing compression or with increasing pressure and this is a stability condition in that if it's violated the curve is concave down that's an uh, indication of some instability typically a phase transformation for instance so we're assuming fluid like behavior with a simple diagram so with this as background you can understand that if you put in some sort of pressure wave of finite magnitude, finite amplitude, but any shape of pressure waves you want, the tendency is for the front of that wave to steepen up with distance or with time. And the reason is because the high pressure portion of the wave is moving at a higher velocity than the foot of the wave. And so we end up developing a shock front from any finite pressure, uh, finite amplitude pressure wave that goes through the sample. In fact, I'm going to tell you something that seems not to be well understood even by the specialists in shock waves. And that is that the sound velocity at high pressure is very close to the shock wave velocity. So when we talk about shock wave velocities, we're really talking about the sound velocity at the peak pressure. Meanwhile, the back end here, at some point there's a rarefaction, a decompression wave that comes along. And two uh, comments I need to make about it. First of all, remember since um, velocity, sound velocities increase with compression, it means that this rarefaction actually gets longer as this uh, shock front or, uh, propagates forward. And that is because the velocity up here is faster than the velocity halfway down. It's faster than the velocity at the tail. So that means this tail will tend to stretch out over distance or over time, just naturally, just as the shock front tends to steepen up. The other comment I'll make is that the sound velocity, that the, this rarefaction here moves at the sound velocity, let's say for this particular pressure, but it's riding along material that already has a material velocity. I'll review that in a moment, so don't worry if you're confused, but I want to give you a preview of that. So rarefactions widen while shocks are self-steepening. Now, unfortunately, you have profound, deep, personal experience with shock waves. I can guarantee this. And I say, unfortunately, because the analogy made by Sir Lighthill with traffic. And shock waves are what we see in traffic, all right? So imagine you're moving on some kind of highway, maybe it's the Autobahn or something. The traffic is moving steadily to the right. And somehow, there's a stoplight or an accident, some reason why the cars stop. And what happens is uh, we, go, we transition from freely moving tra with traffic at some initial relatively low density to a high packing density of the cars as they come to a screeching ha halt. And the interface between the low and the high pressure states, this is now in the frame of reference of the stopped cars. That interface is now moving at the shockwave velocity. And the flow of material of cars is actually the material or particle velocity. So this is a very natural shock front. And it's self-steepening. It's very dangerous if you don't pay attention. If the cars are all stopped and somehow the light turns or the accident has been cleared, then there's a tendency for the stopped cars to start moving forward, first row, the next row, and so on. And you see you produce a rarefaction wave, and it is self-widening, if you want, as contrasted with a shock front. Okay, any questions? So again, you have natural experience with shock, shock waves. Before I give you any derivations, I want to emphasize how useful this is. And I'll give you kind of a prosaic example, which is if we want to study our own planet's interior, the main information, the most detailed information we have of the interior comes from seismology, measuring elastic waves generated by 
for example, earthquakes that travel through the interior. And so seismologists have measured the seismic waves that go through the rocky mantle of the Earth, through the metallic core of the Earth. And many years ago, Francis Birch, very famous geophysicist at Harvard, put together this plot of the sound velocities as a function of density for the Earth's interior, the rocky part and the metal part, and then for the elements that had been studied by shock waves by his friends McQueen and Marsh. Uh, who had been starting this work in the early 50s. So this was published in 1961, okay, quite a while ago. And what it shows is very clearly that the, um, first of all, that the composition of the mantle is fundamentally different from that of the core. The mantle is m like elements around aluminum or oxygen. We know it's an oxide, it's a ceramic rock. Whereas the core is more like the properties of iron, okay? It's not pure iron, but close to that. I just wanted to say nowadays we can redo this nice plot of birches. Now I'm going to do this for a couple of different reasons. First of all, here's a modern version of Birch's plot. The sound velocities of metals derived from shock experiments shown as a function of density. So we go from beryllium to magnesium. This is just a tiny subset of what you can find in the handbooks and I'll give you the references later on. And you can again convince yourself that the modern measurements of the seismic wave velocities, the sound velocities from seismology for the mantle and the core and the densities, which by the way were not measured at the time of birch, but nowadays are measured for the deep mantle and for the core. They really match up very nicely for an iron-rich alloy for the core and for the mantle itself also in the range of oxides or around magnesium aluminum silicate range. Now there's a little detail here that I think is quite interesting that should reassure you how fundamentally robust this result is. And that's a detail I mentioned earlier. The sound velocity at high pressures is very nearly equal to the shock wave velocity. I will show you how to derive these sound velocities, but jumping ahead, let me show you the ratio of the sound velocity along the Hugonio divided by the shock wave velocity for various, uh, these are pressure derivatives of the bulk modules, various equations of state as a function of compression. And the point that you're supposed to get here is for pr compressions of 10, 20, maybe up to 30%. We're within 10% of the shockwave velocity equal to the sound velocity. So you don't even have to worry about these corrections. Well, for a geophysicist, you know, 10% is really not very important. I just made the point here by plotting not the sound velocities, but the uncorrected shockwave velocities just straight out of the handbooks to show that indeed the mantle and the core of the Earth are rock and metal respectively. Okay, so that's the background. I hope a little bit of motivation. And now we do have to do a little bit of homework so I can give you the equations that you can uh, use yourself, yourselves. You've seen them already earlier today or some subset of these. These are, again, the conservation relations known as the Hugonio relations. So imagine that we're going to look at a small volume element inside the shock region and what happens in a period of time, some unit amount of time, the shock front moves from this left hand line over to the right double line. So per unit time, the volume that's engulfed per unit cross-sectional area coming out of the board is given by this length here defined by the shockwave velocity. This is our volume element. It would be in 3D except out of the board again we have unit cross-sectional area. So what's happened is a material to the right at zero pressure, initial density and initial energy and at zero initial material velocity is accelerated to a finite material velocity at high energy, at high density or smaller volume and at high pressures. So in the back, the, where the shock wave had started, that, those atoms now have moved forward in unit time by the amount given by the material velocity. And that immediately gives us the balance for mass conservation. The amount of mass in this volume element before the shock wave has gone across it is the initial density times the shock wave velocity. That's just the volume in here. And after the shock wave has traversed, we have material at high densities, but now in a reduced volume given by the shock velocity minus the particle velocity. So the dashed line, that distance out here. That's the amount of volume engulfed. So think of the particle velocity here as proportional to the volume change on compression. And formally, I, I've just redone this equation up here down, down at the bottom. Conservation of linear momentum is the same idea. You know that pressure is force per unit area. You know that force is mass times acceleration. So we take our initial mass here, 
rho naught times the shock velocity, <coughs> that's our ma <coughs> mass, <coughs> excuse me, mass, times the acceleration, the material's been accelerated up to the material velocity or particle velocity u sub p, so that gives us the force. Well, this is all per unit area, so it's the same as the pressure, and indeed the pressure change across the shock front is given by rho naught times us, the so-called impedance times the particle velocity. I've again <coughs> repackaged these equations at the bottom because you see them in other forms in other places. Finally, and this to me is the most amazing, <clears throat> we can do thermodynamics with shock waves. I'll come back and reiterate that point of, in a few moments, <clears throat> but let me first derive the result. And the point is that in shock waves, we first have a compressional energy, which is the mass times the, I'm sorry, the pressure times the volume change. So we take our pressure, and remember the volume change is essentially given by the particle velocity. So we have a pressure times the particle velocity. That gives us this grouping here. Density, shock velocity times particle velocity squared, but we have to throw away half that energy. We don't have to, we do throw away half that energy by accelerating the material from zero initial velocity up to that finite material velocity. And the way I can convince you of that is if you calculate that kinetic energy, which is just moving the material, it doesn't heat it, it doesn't contribute to the thermodynamics, it's just the material is now moving. That's just one half mv squared, one half the mass times the particle velocity squared. It turns out it's exactly half of what we gained in the compression. So per unit mass, what we end up getting is half of the pressure volume work because the other half is thrown away to kinetic energy. And another way to re rewrite this is that energy change is a particle velocity squared divided by two. There's a very nice graphical interpretation of this, which is on a pressure volume plot. <coughs> The blue curve is the so-called Hugonio, the set of shock states that are achieved on shock loading. This straight line is the actual path <clears throat> from the initial volume, the starting point, zero pressure, to the final state. And this is the actual path that the material follows. This energy is exactly the area under that path, the little red triangle that's shown right here. So this is uh, a way of thinking about the energetics and the heating of shock waves. I feel so strongly about this point, I'm going to reiterate it again. It's amazing that you can do thermodynamics on a process which is profoundly non-equilibrium. Let me explain why. The first law of thermodynamics <coughs> tells us that the internal energy change is the work plus the heat that's, that's exchanged. But this is a totally adiabatic process. It's not isentropic. It's adiabatic. And that means there's no heat exchange. And that means all of the internal energy is given by the work. And actually, there's a conversion of entropy out of this process that heats up the sample material. So this is actually quite a profound result. Any questions so far? So far, so good. OK. So here I want to um, take a short sidestep. We find empirically, totally empirically, <clears throat> that if we plot the shock velocity versus the material velocities for materials, in general, in many, many instances, they follow a linear relationship. And the intercept is basically the sound velocity at zero pressure. And then we have a pressure-dependent term or material velo velocity-dependent term, S, that adds to the linearity. Actually, this coefficient, S, is related to the pressure derivative of the bulk modulus, as you'll just see in a few moments. That's true for metals like lead. For oxides like MgO, it's even true when there are phase transformations. Here's a, there's a delta V due to a phase transformation. So it gives an offset in the particle velocity. We'll come back and talk about those in a moment. So just to convince you, <coughs> we're really getting thermodynamic and equation of state information here. Here are better some measurements <coughs> of the pressure derivative, the bulk modulus for a variety of materials, ceramics, metals, salts, and so on, from ultrasonics, and also from static compression. You see the typical range between, let's say, 3 and 6, 3 and 7. Here's a collection of shock wave <coughs> linear USUP equations of state. And then I've converted over to the equivalent value of the pressure derivative. The formula is very simple up here. And so so you see, again, the same kind of distribution. Actually, this relationship here is derived exactly just by going through an equation of state analysis that I'll come to in just a moment. But the point is that we're getting real thermodynamic and elasticity data out of the shockwaves. And don't forget, at very low stresses, at very low impact velocities, a shockwave is just like an elastic wave. So <clears throat> this is maybe a bit of a technicality, but it's nice to know <clears throat> that for this simple equation of state, um, 
We can uh, rewrite our conservation equations in simplified form for this linear shock velocity particle velocity relationship. And you see that the pressure goes as the strain, this is a volume strain, divided by another factor. We can get the derivative of the equation of state, and we can get the energy change as well. We actually often look at equations of state more generally using a non-dimensional version. I'm just going to leave this with you if you ever want to look at this, but we don't have to belabor it. It's just to say we can do a lot of analysis of forms of equations of state. What you need to understand from a practical point of view is how do we actually take data and turn it into something useful? Those conservation relations mean <clears throat> that we have a relationship between about typically five parameters, and we only know three parameters, so we have to measure at least two parameters. And typically those are velocities, material velocities and shock velocities using those optical techniques. So the method that we use is called uh, impedance matching. And first let me have you imagine a symmetric impact, that is an impact of a projectile into a target material of the same material. Think of iron impacting iron. This is really important because when you ask how do I know that the equation of state for those metals is determined, this is how they were determined before we knew anything else from shockwave studies. And so on impact, the impact velocity is u sub zero. There's some equation of state, let's say it's not initially known, some equation of state for this material, our material iron. We know that on impact, since it's symmetric, the velocity, the material velocity of the target will be accelerated to half the impact velocity and the projectile will be decelerated to half the initial impact velocity due to the symmetry. What we do measure as well as that impact velocity, so now we know the material velocity, we can also measure the transit time of the shock wave through our target or through our projectile. And knowing the initial density, rho zero times the shock velocity gives us the pressure if we know the particle velocity. So there's nothing else to be determined. It's very, very straightforward. So this is a simple situation because it's symmetric. What happens if we have an asymmetric impact just takes a little bit longer to think about it. What happens is, let's say, for instance, <clears throat> that we have an impactor that we now know what its equation of state is. Maybe it's iron. And maybe this is a natural experiment. It's an iron meteorite hitting the oceans or hitting rock on Earth. So we have our impactor coming in at this initial impactor velocity. We can still use the same construction if we measure the initial density of the target and the shock velocity through the target, that gives us this slope. And really, we're solving for the mutual conditions of pressure and particle velocity so that the particle velocities are uniform across this interface, and so the pressures are uniform. And think about that. That's simply, both of them are, if you want, continuity conditions. First of all, continuity requires that you have the same velocity on both sides of the interface, otherwise you'd have atoms piling on top of each other, or you would have a gap that forms. It's not physical at high pressures. Similarly, the pressures have to be the same on both sides of this interface. They have to equalize each other microscopically, and so that's basically the condition we have here. So for a very stiff impact, into a soft material. The stiff impactor is not slowed down as much. The soft material is accelerated quite a bit, so they end up at a mutual uh, material velocity and uh, the, also at the mut mutual pressure. Any questions? Okay, a little bit technical now. How do we analyze this? I'm going to quickly go through some thermodynamics. I'll put the equations up, but don't worry about the equations too much. Mostly think about the concepts. We think about equations of state, thermal equations of state, often in terms of an isotherm. That is the effect of pressure on volume, and then the effect of temperature on that equation of state. So thermal expansion at high pressure shifts us to larger volumes at high temperatures in general. And a lot of analysis and interest in how you estimate the thermal expansion coefficient at high pressures and temperatures and so on. So that's one approach. That's not the approach we use with shock waves. And the reason I can tell you right now is because we don't know the temperatures very well, and we don't know how to make these corrections very well. What we do know about is the internal energy. So we use a different formulation. Many of you in this room know this, but I want to really emphasize for those who don't, instead of thinking about thermal expansion, in our minds we think of the sample as being clamped and we heat it up 
keeping the volume constant. We heat it up, it wants to expand, it can't expand, so its pressure increases. And that's really what we're determining, is this thermal pressure offset. And we formulate this in terms of a Grunison parameter, gamma, um, and an energy change. And basically, the Grunison parameter is simply defined as that pressure change divided by the internal energy change associated with it changing the temperature. And we multiply times the volume so that we get a dimensionless parameter. That's really nice. Thermal expansion is not dimensionless, and that gives us some problems. Grunison parameter is dimensionless, so in many ways we have systematics that we can use there. I'll show you how we measure the Grunison parameter at high pressures and temperatures in just a moment. But the point is that this lays a foundation for our analyzing shock Huguenio. So I said this is uh, in terms of isotherms, but imagine a shock Huguenio is a set of states that with increasing pressure also have an increase in temperature. So they're basically an intersection of a bunch of isotherms at high temperatures as shown here. So we use this thermal me and thermal pressure equation of state approach because now we have variables like pressure and internal energy that are natural complements to the Hugonio equations that we were just discussing. In detail, we tend not to actually use the isotherms. We tend to base everything on isentropes. Now remember, the shock is an adiabat, but not an isentrope. So actually the offset of the shock, the fact that it's getting hot relative to the isentrope, is something that we're actually trying to correct for. This is actually the dissipative heating. But it's the same idea, and we can calculate the compressional energy associated with an isentrope. It's just the area under the curve of the isentrope. We can calculate the thermal pressure if we know the Grunison parameter and the thermal pressure and the, th the thermal energy, and these are things that we can derive from our shockwave experiments. And what we'll see is that very typically the Grunison parameter, as you may already know, has values of around 1 to 2. It's dimensionless. Very typically the Grunison parameter is proportional to the volume. That is, the ratio of Grunison parameter to volume is about constant. And very typically, and very surprisingly perhaps, at high temperatures and pressures, the Grunison parameter is independent of temperature. That's a real benefit over the thermal expansion coefficient. So jumping in, we make a thermal equation of state of the Mie-Grunison form. The offset between the Huguenot pressure and the isentrope pressure is given by the internal energy difference. Think of it just as the thermal temperature difference multiplied by the Grunison parameter divided by the volume. This is really just how the Grunison parameter is defined. Well, we know how to calculate the Huguenot energy. So actually, the Huguenot equations gives us the Huguenot energy minus the initial energy. And then we want to relate that to to the isentrope energy, this one right here, minus the initial energy. So we separate those out. This is our Hugonio energy that we derived a few moments ago. This is just the area under the isentrope. This is just the isentropic compression energy. We have all the information we need if we can determine the Grunison parameter. But let me package it together. We put all those, okay, maybe I went too fast. We, we put terms together here. We have Hugonio pressure on the left, we have Hugonio pressure on the right. We bring those two terms together and we have a term of like one over, uh, one times, one minus gamma over V divided by two that we uh, divide through in the denominator. It's just a little bit of algebra. So that's basically where this comes from so that we have the Hugonio pressure on the left. This is what we want to calculate. This is the isentrope pressure, the isentrope energy, Grunison parameter. Well, if we know how to calculate these, let's say from some assumed equation of state or some theoretical calculation, now we can derive the Hugonio pressure. Okay, it's a lot of material, but it's here for you. It'll be available for your reference if you want to get to it. One little detail, by the way. Notice that if the volume change on shock compression reaches a certain condition so that, so that 2 over V0 minus VH is equal to gamma over VH, that the Huguenio pressure becomes infinite. That's kind of an interesting instability. What it means physically, and it actually does happen, is that at a certain point as you hit your sample harder and harder, instead of compressing it more, you're now heating it so much more quickly that there's a, if you want to run away thermal instability, you just can't get it densified any further, and it simply uh, goes into an infinite compression. And actually, this leads me to the issue of how do we determine the uh, Grunison parameter at high pressures. And there are various methods, but one of the best and one of the oldest is to look at porous materials. So let me first give you the schematic version. We talked about an isentrope. We talked about a Hugonio, a shock compression curve. Now if we started with a sample that was at a larger initial volume, 
it really all it means is in this formula, we change this term right here, the initial volume, went over the initial density and make it larger. Now we have a much larger area, if you want, under, under the triangle. And so now we have a much hotter Hugonio for a material that was initially porous. And that is, in fact, what's hap what, what is actually observed. This has been seen for many, many years. It's an example from our Russian colleagues. Nickel, non-porous metallic nickel has a well-defined Hugonio. And then for a huge variety of porosities, they've collected compression, shock compression curves. Notice that for low compression, you just get kind of a small thermal expansion effect. But at a certain point, you're putting in so much thermal pressure, you don't get any further densification. And in some cases, actually, you're making the material expand on higher shock loading, which is kind of amazing, okay? So anyway, we can analyze these data to get the Gruneisen parameter. And this is really one of the amazing results. Remember, the Gruneisen parameter is just the ratio of thermal pressure to thermal energy, and we have a porous Hugonio pressure minus the regular Hugonio pressure. That gives us kind of a thermal pressure effect. Down here is just the difference in the Hugonio energies, this is the thermal Hugonio energy difference, and from these we can put together Gruneisen parameters. So this, these are data for iron. In fact, for the high pressure phase of iron as a function of density, and it may be hard for you to read from the back, but I have different symbols for the starting density. So iron starts at over 7 grams per cubic centimeter, and then different porosities, this is 6.97, 6.00, and 4.77, and then this is uh, in the low pressure phase. But you can't tell this very well from from the small data points, but there's really no difference depending on the initial density. That's another way of saying it doesn't matter how hot these samples are, given density, the Gruneisen parameter within the scatter, okay, is, is more or less the same. And there's no systematic difference. Remember I said the Gruneisen parameter seems to be pretty independent of temperature, and that's what we find. So that gives us the Gruneisen parameter. And um, well, we can use the same method that we did in constructing the Hugonio pressure with the thermal pressure, take the derivative of the equation of state, the derivative of the Hugonio, and that gives us the bulk modulus along the Hugonio. Here's a result. I'll give you the equation in just a moment. Here's, here's a result shown for iron again. It's a function of density. But let me give you the actual equation. So what we do is exactly the same equation we had for Hugonio pressure in terms of the isentrope and the isentrope energy and all that. We just differentiate it, and that gives us uh, the, the bulk modulus or the bulk sound velocity along the Hugonio in terms of the slope of the Hugonio, Gruneisen parameter and Hugonio pressure. So as long as we know Gruneisen parameter from porous data, for example, we can derive this. Or some people use this the other way around. If you could measure sound velocity along the Hugonio, maybe you can get the Gruneisen parameter out of this. So I, here I show again for iron, the bulk modulus, so you can think of this as a bulk sound velocity squared times density as a function of pressure to pressures that exist inside the Earth's core. That's how those Birch plots were calculated, okay? Using the data from the Queen et al. And if you have a linear USUP relation, it's particularly easy to get all of this stuff. It's all you do it uh, on the back of an envelope, as they say. So what's cool about this is now we have the Gruneisen parameter we have the bulk modulus derived from shockwave data. We can package these things together to determine the thermal expansion coefficient. Remember, we said we didn't like it because it's so hard to determine. We can determine it because the thermal expansion coefficient thermodynamically is related to the Gruneisen parameter, volume or density, specific heat, and bulk modulus. And I'll tell you something that you already know. I can guess the specific heat at high pressures and temperatures all better than you can measure it. All right? So the first approximation, of course, it'll be the Dulon Petit value for C sub V, constant volume heat capacity. But you can make corrections uh, around that. And what you find when you stick in typical numbers for specific heat, for Gruneisen parameter between 1 and 2, for bulk modulus about a megabar, you find values for thermal expansion coefficient in the order of 10 to the minus fifth per Kelvin, and that's what you see experimentally. Okay, So now we've actually got a method to uh, measure if you want the thermal expansion coefficient. I want to be careful here. Everything is measured, but we did make a theoretical estimate, if you want, of the heat capacity, and depending on how closely you want that determined, you you may have to agonize about that a little. So I know we're getting on in time, but I want to talk briefly about how we can apply these data to finding the functional form of the equation of state. Actually, the functional form of the equation of state that we might use is not that interesting in a sense, except it's the derivative for the cohesive energy as a function of volume. So this little curve that from which we're trying to identify what defi defines our data very uh, the, the best way is extracted from just a little tiny subset of this 
energy curve as a function of volume. And these will be finite, uh, these will be familiar names to those of you who have looked at it. And I'll tell you right now, there's only a pair of these that really work very well time and again. They're the so-called Eulerian finite strain or Birch Murnahan form of equation of state. And the Vinay Rose, or I noticed earlier we were reminded the Rydberg equation of state. It's actually uh, been in the literature for a long time. So I've identified those by this blue shading. Wherever you see the blue shading, that's the preferred, the ones that work best. Why do I say they work best? Well, it's very simple. It's completely empirical. What we find is we make finite strain measurements, finite compression measurements using diamond anvil data or shock waves, and then we compare against infinitesimal strain measurements from ultrasonics, Brillat scattering, and the like. And what we find is when we have finite compression data and we fit it with one functional form or another, the slopes that we get, the the bulk modulus and its pressure derivative depend on the functional form of the equation of state. When we use the birch murnahan equation of state or the Vinay, we get a good fitting with ultrasonic data. When we use a different formulation, we get a very poor fitting. It's completely empirical. Maybe there's some fundamental physics that one or the other represents, but this is so far completely empirical. So we actually do this in a little more detail by taking the expression for the birch murnahan similarly for Vinay, and repackaging it. Notice we divide the pressure by bulk modulus and these few terms so that we have basically the slope of the isotherm or the adiabat or the isentrope as a, as a power series expansion. And by the way, so this is not new. Francis Birch really developed this, the normalized pressure versus strain. We use this to analyze data and to package it together. I'll show that in a moment. And we do the same thing for Hugonia data. We can package it together. I won't go into the details. I just want to give you the flavor. The equations are here and we're close to the end. But we can put together data. This is diamond anvil data with ultrasonics, which gives us the intercept and the slope here with shockwave data. These are the raw data. These are with the thermal corrections. So we can analyze all the data simultaneously. You can remove data if you don't like them. Or, well, you have to be a little more objective than that. Or, but you can actually fit all the data simultaneously. And so what we find from these kinds of analysis is that Eulerian finite strain, Birch Murnahan, and the Vinay Rydberg equations state work very well. And by the way, they're remarkably consistent with the US UP, linear USUP relation. I show these Hugonios for the linear shock velocity relation. Here's the pressure. Here's the internal energy versus volume. You can calculate using these equations of state the isentropes, the pressure, and the internal energy. And the difference between those, shown by the dash curves, are the thermal pressure and the thermal energy. You can divide one by the other and get a new estimate of the Grunheisen parameter under compression. OK, you get the idea. So I'm not going to belabor this very well, except to say that they're quite consistent. I know I'm pushing it, so I want to take just a moment to talk about how things are really progressing now in terms of changing, modifying, manipulating this dissipated heating. Think of the dissipated heating as a heating other than the compression work that's associated with all this uh, high temperature of shock waves. And um, we want to make that red area as small as possible. So one way to do that is to pre-compress the sample, for example, in a diamond anvil cell. And we do this for laser shock experiments. Another is by doing multiple shock compression, or in the limit, kind of a ramp compression. Again, something that's done with lasers, but also to some limited degree with physical impacts. And by changing the initial density, we can cool down the Hugonios. Instead of having a high pressure at relatively modest densities with pre-compression or multi-shock compression and ramp compression, we can almost approach the isentrope at very high pressure. So this is a fantastic tool. And just so you know, it's not just theory. Here's one of our diamond anvil cells being uh, destroyed at the Omega laser at uh, University of Rochester. And again, we're using two methods, either a shock loading with, this, with a laser pulse through a diamond anvil cell or ramp loading. Oh, by the way, we can even do the ramp loading with a diamond anvil cell. And so I'm going to talk more about this on Monday, I guess, but we've done some experiments on carbon with this ramp loading, and I don't want to belabor that. I know that um, I, I promised to mention phase transitions. They do happen. They show up as an offset in particle velocity versus shock velocity, which really corresponds to a volume change right here. Here are data, sodium chloride, graphite, many other materials, well known. And you can analyze this material uh, that's phase transformed just as what we were doing before. You can get those equations of state of the high pressure phases. You have to deal with the energy of transformation. There's a little more in the way of trade-off in the analysis, but you can do the same thing. By the way, Hey, 
the effects of strength that I said we'll ignore. I'll just give it the one word to say it's actually very similar to phase transformations in many ways. There's a break in slope as the material goes through the, the dynamic yielding pressure on compression. Really what's happening is we're changing the material from having a velocity for the pressure wave equal to the elastic velocity, longitudinal velocity, dropping down to this fluid-like bulk sound velocity. That's what happens at the Hugonio elastic limit. And so we can analyze this in terms of strengths of material, and also there's a characteristic breaking out into multiple shock fronts. This is useful because we can measure, once again, the sound velocity from the rarefaction waves themselves. And this is what was done very famously first by, um, by Mike Brown and, and, um, and McQueen, Bob McQueen, and then more recently, 10, 10, 11 years ago, by the Livermore Group to look at the melting of iron as the sound velocity drops from the longitudinal velocity to the bulk sound velocity at about two megabars. So these data are collected in this set of handbooks. There are many sources of data. But here's a handbook you can get on the web that has a whole bunch of Lazl shock data. Here's a set of data that's actually computer accessible from the Russian Academy of Sciences Institutes of, Institute of Problems of Chemical Physics. And this is a book by one of our Russian colleagues, by Trunin. That's again a compendium like that one that gives you a lot of shockwave data. So with that, I have taken us to the limit but I'm gonna show one more slide, okay? One more slide, and that is, what are these places? Does anyone know what Lazl is? It's not called that anymore. Anyone? So I know someone does here. What? Lazl? Gee, okay, I, maybe I'm the only old guy around here. Okay, Los Alamos Scientific Lab. Does anyone know what uh, RFNC, Russian Federation Nuclear Center? These are the nuclear labs. Okay, and so I wanted to make one point at the end here. This is all technical stuff, it's interesting, it's important, it tells us about the nature of our planet, the origin of our planets and others. But this science was born in war. And we should understand that. I'm just talking history right now. I'm not trying to pontificate or make any editorializing at all. But this science, the modern shockwave studies, were really developed as uh, part of war efforts, including the Cold War. And this is an opinion at the bottom that we should be working towards making a better world. But the point is we should be aware of that. Just like we ask our colleagues in biology and chemistry to understand what are some of the more troublesome or dangerous applications of those technologies, we should be aware of the potential proliferation in our area. So I leave you with that, and I will simply say that I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Here's the outline of my talk, so as to remind you how much we've covered. <laughs> they will be available so that you'll have the equations available to you, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have time. Yes. Um, so I think you might have said it when you were talking about symmetrical impacts, but I didn't just yeah. So when you meet, talk about symmetrical impacts, that also means the target has have the exact same mass shape. It's the only that it's the same material, okay? And then uh, another thing I didn't belabor, but since you give me the opportunity, I've set all of this up assuming the target is not moving and the impactor is moving, and I, I, will, I can leave it as a homework problem for you to imagine what if the target had an initial velocity, and it turns out all you have to do is measure everything relative to that initial velocity so that you're in a frame of reference as though the target is not moving. So it ends up uh, modifying the equations a tiny bit, but otherwise really the only assumption is that the materials are the same materials at the same conditions. Remember we're assuming both of them are at zero pressure, both of them are at the same temperature, if you want, ambient temperature. You can now, you're smart enough to figure out, okay, gee, what if somehow one of those was at a different temperature, maybe due to pre-existing impacts or something, you actually have the tools to make a calculation of that correction, but in general, when we say symmetric impact, we just mean the same material. Okay, one of them's moving and the other one's not. Any other questions? Huh? Yes? Can I make a remark for the students? Please. Okay. Uh, the two talks of today are uh, from your final literature, the term horizon parameter. Yeah. 
take care because have you okay uh, on Raman spectroscopy and on the experiment you will find a horizon parameter for a given mode that measures how a given variational mode changes with pressure. Okay? Sometimes it involves some tricky uh, the bulk modules of the material. Be careful with this comparison with this horizon parameter. It's the thermodynamic horizon parameter that I've used in the new horizon of for the present of state. Okay? Absolutely. That's a very important point. It's a very, very important difference. Because yep. there's some confusion in the literature. Okay? So the other comes from the level of measurement on the pressure. And if all these horizon parameters are equal, then this equals that horizon. So, so let, me be, uh, let me amplify a little more explicitly and be rude, since I have made measurements of the mode green eisen parameter, both with infrared spectroscopy and with Raman spectroscopy. And first of all, you have to remember that they're at the so-called zone center, so these are for long wavelengths, and they're a finite number of modes. You're lucky if you get four, eight, ten mode green eisen parameters. Out of ten to the 24th, Okay, out of 10 to the 24th, it is an extreme subsampling of the actual mode Grunison parameters because most of the Brunei zone we can't see with our techniques. Now, okay, of course, with neutrons, there are some methods, of, uh, neutrons being among the, the, the better known, where you can sample inside the zone center, but I will again have to emphasize that it's rare that one can get, let's say, more than a dozen or two dozen. It doesn't matter. Compared to 10 to the 24th, you're getting incredible subsampling with the mode gammas. Now, it's not that bad. That's why people like us make those mode gamma measurements, because if you have any kind of theoretical tool, you can use that theory to, if you want, extend those finite small number of measurements of mode gammas to get estimates of the thermodynamic gamma. So I, I, I really think your point is very important, and I, I appreciate your making it. Uh, we, we, we rarely, when, when I do spectroscopy, I don't mention this. We're only measuring a few out of 10 to the 24 moles <laughs> for vibrational spectrum. Okay. Can I have more questions? Please. It's the general question, but I don't understand why you can apply pure thermodynamics to the subwave experiments because it's not it is. Isn't it? Yep. And I'm really glad you asked that, and that's really why I put in this slide to, to, to make this point. It is a remarkable fact. So think back, the definition of the first law is really that internal energy is equal to work plus heat, and that there's a trade-off between the two. And the only reason you, we can get away with this is because we don't have any heat transfer. So we, we really are thinking of an isol thermally isolated system, but internally there's entropy production, and in detail, you can now let your imagination go wild, defects are being formed, you know, there's all sorts of breaking and crushing, all sorts of stuff is going on, and it is heating up the material, but it's all associated associated with this mechanical work being done on the material. And so in the end, that's why you can get away with this, but it's kind of a, it's a remarkable effect. Now, are there exceptions? Yes, there, are, there can be exceptions, and um, I can say in passing, that's why it's actually very useful to measure the temperature or the thermal spectrum of your material. It is conceivable that the material, if you, for example, measure it on an extremely short time scale, hasn't had a chance to make an equilibrium black body spectrum, if I can put it that way. In that case, this argument fails, actually. That would be an example where experimentally you can actually t check how well this does. But in general, it's amazing how quickly the thermalization happens. And, um, you know, it's actually kind of amazing because you're pushing on the sample in one direction. So if you start thinking about it, you'll activate modes of oscillation and translation in one direction. But within the time scale, which might be tens of picoseconds or a few nanoseconds, there's a randomization in 3D to make a finite thermal spectrum. And that happens fortunately quickly enough for most materials, so we don't have to worry. But it's something, the kind of thing we think about and, and try and measure. I invite, by the way, any comments from other specialists on this point. It's technical in a way, but it's very interesting for those of us who like to apply thermodynamics. Yeah? Are there any limitations for what samples we can investigate? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are limitations, of course. Yeah. So there's a range of very practical limitations. Um, I, uh, for instance, 
we, we like to use bigger rather than smaller samples because the smaller the sample, typical wave velocities are kilometers per second, which is the same as millimeters per microsecond, which is the same as microns per nanosecond. So if you give me a sample that's just a few microns across, the whole experiment is over in a, in a nanosecond or less. You actually saw some examples. That means I have to measure to within picoseconds. Okay, so there are real challenges with small samples. You have, want to have a uniform sample. Then the loading itself has to be very homogeneous. If it's a big plate that's impacting something, fine. If it's a laser beam, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to just admit to you, you know, the laser-driven shock compression is very, very challenging to have a nice uniform uh, intensity across the sample as a function of time, well recorded. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this on Monday morning. It is amazing what's being done at modern facilities, the National Ignition Facility in, in the United States, the Gecko Laser in Japan, but it's still very, very challenging to do that. So beyond that, I, I can, I'm happy to go into more details, but I think you get the idea. Yes? You mentioned the nuclear weapons. Uh, experiments, experiments uh, using nuclear weapons. What's the, the advantage? Uh, no, so I didn't mean it that way. The programs, the, the first big shockwave programs were set up for the Manhattan Project. But I will say, so you, I, I mentioned on some of my slides that shockwaves provide the highest pressures in the laboratory. But the highest pressures that have been measured are with shock waves outside the laboratory. Okay, <laughs> and I think, as far as I know, the record in terms of what's in the public domain or has been published is from our Russian colleagues. In fact, Trunin was very heavily involved. In fact, if you look at his book, I think it's, I'm going to make a statement that I think is correct. Um, but 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 correct me if you find out differently. In his book, when you read it, you you get the impression that he's kind of sad that the Russian Federation uh, ratified the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty because it's a class of experiments that we can't do anymore. Is the, the way you put it. But the point is that measurements were made up into the hundreds of megabar range by our Russian colleagues. I think we in the I, when we in the United States, what I know about Sonny Reagan and also Bill Nelson at Livermore, did measurements into the tens of megabars and barely into a few hundred megabar. But that's really, as far as we know, that's part of our past rather than the future. Yeah. I mostly made, want to make the point that we have to acknowledge the history of where this comes from. And so there are connections of the science with that history. Thank you.